Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is a special live episode of Dispatches. After 90 days of live stream genocide in Gaza, Israel has yet to achieve its military objectives. It hasn't destroyed Hamas. It hasn't released all its hostages. And it's losing the propaganda war. At the same time, its leadership looks increasingly irrational and desperate as it seeks to escalate on all fronts. Israel has been playing with fire, attempting to drag Hezbollah into an all-out war in Lebanon after assassinating a senior Hamas leader with an airstrike in Beirut. Days earlier, the Israelis assassinated an Iranian commander in Syria. But if Israel can't defeat Hamas's Qassam brigades, which are operating under the harshest conditions from inside a besieged death camp, how on earth do they think they can even begin to properly face the much larger and far more powerful Hezbollah without severe consequences? Hezbollah has so far responded to Israel with a balance of power and restraint, asserting its deterrent capacity while avoiding full-scale war. Meanwhile, the U.S., despite public pronouncements of wanting to contain the genocide to Gaza, has in the last week killed Yemeni naval officers for blocking ships in the Red Sea and assassinated an Iraqi commander in an airstrike in Baghdad, all to protect Israel's ability to continue carrying out its genocide unimpeded. As the imperialists climb higher and higher up the escalation ladder, it's becoming clear that Israel and the U.S. are behaving like rogue and reckless states, while the resistance axis are the adults in the room. The restraint and patience of those the U.S. labels terrorists is the only reason the Middle East isn't on fire right now. But the longer the genocide in Gaza goes on and the longer the U.S. and Israel provoke their adversaries, the more likely regional war becomes. So what happens next? Can Israel even win militarily? Can the U.S., if regional war breaks out, what might that escalation look like in the coming days, weeks, and months? And who decides if and when the big war breaks out? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by veteran war correspondent and analyst, Elijah Magnier. Elijah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I really appreciate you coming on to give us some military analysis of what's taking place across the region. And I wanna go across the different fronts, but before we get into some of the recent developments, I just wanted to point out that you were one of the first correspondents to visit Sabra and Shatila back in the 80s after the Israelis oversaw a essentially far-right Lebanese massacre of Palestinians in these two camps. Um, and, you know, you've seen from that what the Israelis are capable of. I mean, it's one of the most horrific massacres to take place throughout the Lebanese civil war. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that and relate it to what we're seeing in Gaza. Well, actually, I covered the Israeli invasion to Lebanon uh, in 1982. And uh, I very much remember when the Israelis bombarded all the media offices in West Beirut. And uh, they were very upset about the, the coverage of all the media, including the American, the French, the Italian, the Spaniard, everybody. And um, I remember that the Israeli at that time killed more than 18,000 people when they have surrounded uh, Lebanon or Beirut, and then they broke into most part of Lebanon. And one day I received a call from uh, um, an officer in the Lebanese army. He was a first lieutenant at that time, and uh, with whom I had some good contacts as a journalist. And he asked me uh, around the middle of the night if I know anything about a uh, firearm uh, taking place in the camps of Sabra and Shatila. And I said, uh, no, I haven't heard anything. Uh, because at that time, the Israelis were imposing a curfew in the city. And as a journalist, I could have moved. Uh, it was possible for me to move around. Uh, but it was a dark pitch, no electricity, nothing, because we had no water, electricity. And it's a more or less exactly the same case uh, of Gaza, apart from the intensity of the bombardment. And uh, he said that he had a small unit inside the camps who were referring to him, telling him that he, uh, they were confronted with a group of armed people, uh, instructed them not to come out, whatever they hear or whatever happened outside. And they reported that to the command and this officer phoned me. 
So I have decided to uh, go and have a look. So uh, it was around midnight and there was nobody in the street. It was completely black. And I walk out of my office in a very dark street, going down toward the right, toward the um, the uh, city, uh, the uh, the sportive city that was called, and the uh, UNESCO area. And this is where I found an Israeli checkpoint that stopped me because it was only the checkpoint and I walking. Uh, toward in that direction, and then uh, I identify myself as a journalist, and I said I'm going to the flat where I stay. So I had to lie because I really want to go and have a look what's happening. So I walk uh, in the middle of the night until I reach uh, just a few hundred meters before the beginning of Sabra and Shetila, and that was the roundabout of the Kuwaiti embassy. And before that, there were the houses of the Lebanese uh, officers. It's a place where it's, where it is still there, but it is built for the Lebanese officers to, uh, to give uh, for uh, a free rent or whatever. And uh, this is where I heard a lot of firing coming just ahead of me and on my left-hand side. And the left-hand side was the Palestinian camp. So because it was dark and I didn't want to be shot at without uh, being able to identify myself, I waited under the first light of the morning. And then I ventured outside where I stayed all night on the stairs. And then uh, I saw in front of me, just not very far, a very um, a, a large number of vehicles of Saad Haddad, the, the uh, pro-Israeli Lebanese army that controlled the south of Lebanon, and several Israeli uh, vehicles that were standing with them. So I waited and then they left and I went to the roundabout and then turned left and then left again into the camp. And inside the camp, I saw piles of um, uh, a lot of uh, ground with uh, a work of a bulldozer and I could have seen many legs and uh, um, arms and bodies coming out and then uh, I went into inside the camp and I saw like uh, more than 15 people that were all killed against the wall because one can see all the bullets um, uh, behind them and, uh, and I grabbed um, a number of ID cards and there were Lebanese ID cards so there were people, uh, Lebanese people and Palestinian people. So I went around and I saw many bodies in the street and people who were very scared, who were still alive, but just shyly looking outside the door just to make sure that they're not going to be uh, killed next and that those who were doing the killing have left. And then I took the um, IDs and returned to my office, wrote the story and then phoned my friend who is a retired general today, and um, informed him after I found the story about what happened. Uh, so I delivered all the IDs to the uh, police uh, center that is not far from my office. And this is where I have learned and saw as a first eyewitness the uh, massacre of Sabra and Shatila. Wow. And you can imagine, I mean, that's happening essentially something else along those lines is happening every hour in Gaza. It's just one Sabra and Shatila after another. And so I want to move on to uh, who's winning and who's not winning. I mean, we're hearing different um, versions of who's winning from each side, which makes sense. But like, I want an objective analysis of who is. But first, I think one of the most significant things that happened this week was the assassination of uh, Saleh al aruri the deputy head of Hamas's political bureau in Beirut uh, earlier this week. Um, he was killed in a drone strike by the Israelis, which was a very significant escalation. And you, you covered some of your uh, views on this assassination, um, the circumstances around it, uh, and the other targets that were killed along with Aruri. So I'm curious if you can offer your analysis about the significance of that assassination. And I mean, if you hear the Israelis talk about it, you would think that this was like a huge victory for them to take this guy and his and um, and his associates out. Was it a major victory for Israel?
So uh, I heard your question. Okay. So who is winning? This question has different aspects. So from the military aspect, uh, we see that any army declares objectives before the war, and then these objectives need to be met to justify all the casualties. So far, the Israelis announced, according to higher eds, they have suffered more than 10,500 wounded. Uh, that's according to the hospitals that the Israeli newspaper managed to bring out to the public. And then the Israelis are recognizing only around 560 uh, soldiers and officers killed so far. Now, these numbers are extremely high, but can be really insignificant in case the objectives are met. And the Israeli army's objective are two. First of all, is to destroy Hamas, and second, to free all the prisoners. These two objectives have not been met, and all the Israeli officials today recognize that it is impossible to defeat Hamas, and it is not possible to free all the prisoners without a negotiation with Hamas. Therefore, these objectives have not been met. In conclusion, the Israeli army failed to achieve these objectives. This is a clear failure to the army. Secondly, the failure of the army started on the 7th of October when it was not aware of the plan to attack all the villages outside Gaza and the Gaza envelope. Thirdly, the image of the Israeli army as an invincible one and one of the 18th most powerful armies in the world and the strongest in the Middle East has totally failed in Gaza for a simple reason. Today, Israel has announced it is withdrawing from most part of the north. That part of the north, the Israeli army broke in and declared its occupation on the 7th, 27th of October. And then they said, we have occupied the area. And then they had, we have said, we have controlled the area. So the occupation means a presence on the ground and the Control means the defeat of all sources of resistance. Now, we have seen in the last two months, the Israeli army pulling out, bombarding the north, and then pushing back again, and then being hit by the resistance and then pulling out. This is not a control, and this is not an occupation, to the point that after more than 90 days of war, the Israelis have failed to occupy the north, and they are still engaged in the south, and they are suffering between 15 to 44 casualties per day. Now, what is the objective of the Israeli army? This is an answer nobody can give, not even the army commanders, because they are fighting inside an urban city where they have no experience how to fight an urban warfare, and they are confronted with a resistance determined to defend the ground and is not only in the tunnels, but thanks to the Israeli destruction, the Palestinian resistance is also using, rightly, the rebels. And they are hiding, uh, having command and control centers in a destroyed building that the Israelis managed to flatten most of the north of the uh, Gaza Strip offering golden opportunity to the Palestinian resistance. So this is why we understand from the first beginning the plan was not to go into Gaza. Otherwise, an army would not destroy and offer to the resistance uh, hiding places in so many streets, so many areas, and then being confronted with what they have done and don't know where the attack is coming from, where we see the Israeli army moving in a very relaxed way. But we also see the video emanating from the Palestinian resistance, how they were hitting them and taking all their time to aim and hit or to set up uh, traps and then attract the Israeli infantry to it. So this means there is no control. 
that is not a victory that Israel can claim. But yes, we have to recognize that no army in the world is capable of killing so many children and women in such a small lap of time. In three months, the Israelis managed to kill 23,000 Palestinians, of which, according to the United Nations, 70% are children and women. Now, this is a, a, an achievement, if we dare to call it as such, to the Israeli army that can be given because it is bombing indiscriminately. Now, it also, uh, there are other victories for the Israeli army to register, such as the killing of 133 UN personnel, that the destruction of 230 schools constructed by the European Union and by the United Nations, and the destruction of the hospitals, the justice building, the finance building, the universities, everything. This is the achievement of the Israeli army, and I'm not sure if they are very proud of it. That's one. So real what quick, the, I, well, real quick, I just, because you pointed out all that, basically that's the destruction of civilian infrastructure. But is there a military purpose to that? If I like, like just looking at it very coldly, is there a yes. military purpose of destroying hospitals and of yes. flattening civilian homes? What would the military purpose of that be from the Israeli perspective? Three objectives. Terrorize the population, push them to an exodus. And if the exodus doesn't work for another Nakba like in 1948, turn them against the Palestinian resistance. Mm -hmm. This is what people hope. Uh, this is what the Israelis hope to achieve in the light of the failure of all the military objectives they have announced. But these are hidden objectives. However, in my experience in war zones, during the war, people don't turn against the resistance or don't turn against anyone. People are only thinking, are they going to survive the next day? What about their family members? Are they going to eat? Are they going to be able to feed their children? Are they going to be able to find enough water? What about the medicine? And what about the uh, medical support? Where can they go? They go and they start um, gathering around hospitals because if ever they feel attacked or killed, they know that the ambulances of which Israel have destroyed so many in this war, uh, the, uh, the ambulances don't need to go and fetch them or have the Israeli um, authorization to go and collect their bodies or the bodies of their families. So they stay close to hospitals and this is why the Israelis bomb the entourage of all the hospitals in the north and is doing exactly the same in the south. So basically what the Israelis are saying, we don't want you, just leave. And if you don't leave, we're going to kill as many possible uh, as we can. And if you stay, you're going to live miserably because so far there are more than 350,000 homes that have been completely destroyed in an area where 2.3 million people live in uh, more or less five to six miles wide and um, around 24 miles long. So we're talking about the biggest open air concentration camp where people have been squeezed. And according to the United Nations, there are more than 1,800,000 internally displaced refugees today. That is another achievement of the Israeli army. I don't know if they can be, again, very proud of it, but it seems many members of the Israeli government are indeed very proud of what they have achieved. And they're talking about there is another way of uh, killing the Palestinians. This is what the heritage minister today said. We don't have to kill the Palestinians because they would feel nothing if we kill them. So they have to suffer first. So that is a member of an Israeli cabinet where um, is the way is saying that there will never be a peace with the Palestinians. And the only peace we can give to the Palestinians, not by killing them, but to make them suffer first. And then they kill them. 
Well, so then the question becomes, okay, so that's Il Israel's achievements. But like you mentioned before, they're having to retreat. They're not, their objectives are unclear. Let's move on to Hamas then. What, you know, how, I guess, okay, what are Hamas's achievements? And how long can Hamas last under these circumstances? I mean, they've proven that they can last three months because they're still fighting back quite fiercely, as we can see from the videos they're putting out. But they are in a besieged death camp. So that can only last for so long. So I guess, yeah, let's go to what are Hamas's achievements and how long can they last? A question of how long the resistance can achieve and why I'm saying the resistance for two reasons. First of all, the United Nations consider the Israeli army as an occupation force. Uh, Prime Minister Arya Sharon in 2003 announced that the Israeli army is indeed an occupation force and Barack Obama in 2013 said Israel is an occupation force. For those who disagree with this terminology, Israel stepped in Gaza, it has become an occupation force of Gaza, at least. So for that, there is no doubt. A resistance group can never be defeated and resources can never end because the defeat of the resistance group means the defeat of the population. And as long as there are people living in Gaza, this is where the idea of the far right wing ministers in the Israeli cabinet saying we don't we want to get rid of them and kick them out to Egypt that refuse, and then they talking about Uganda now. It because the presence of the Palestinians, if it is uh, five hundred thousand or one hundred thousand, it means the resistance will always be, be alive. And we have seen how the Palestinian resistance managed to take the uh, bombs, unexploded bombs of tanks and jets that were found in Gaza and turn them against the Israelis and use them against the Israeli infantry. And if you look at the Second World War, Europe uh, was not prepared for the uh, German occupation. And when the Nazi occupied Europe, the resistance had nothing in comparison to what Hamas and the uh, uh, other Palestinian groups inside Gaza have. Moreover, they did not have uh, the uh, knowledge and the experience to manufacture enough bomb at home uh, at the same level of what Hamas today is capable of doing and producing. Therefore, the resources of the resistance never end. And we've seen in every one or two attacks, the Palestinian resistance always managing to recover spoils of war and um, weapons from the Israeli army because the Israelis, when they are hit, and we know from the Israelis, they have dozens of casualties per day, they leave their military material on the ground. And this is where the resistance goes and collect them. So it is not a question that is valid to say how long Hamas and other Palestinian groups can last because they can last as long as there is a population. Why? Because as uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, the Israeli former Prime Minister, who is a brilliant general, and he led the army and led the uh, government, said Hamas cannot be defeated. It is an, an ideology and it is not an organization. And we hear today the American administration, like John Kirby yesterday said, Hamas cannot be defeated. So if we recognize that Hamas cannot be, be defeated, although they don't explain the reason that I'm going to, it's because it is part of the population. No, no resistance in the world can survive a day without the support of the population. So it needs a society to embrace it and to protect it and to support it and to finance it and to encourage it and to uh, help it and to look after it. And this is why Hamas cannot be defeated. Now, what is the victory of Hamas on the 7th of October? I really don't know where to start from. On the 7th of October, Hamas did not attack the civilians uh, in the uh, villages and the cities outside uh, Gaza only. They have attacked 
the Gaza Brigade. They've attacked the Golani uh, Brigade, the special forces, who declared they have suffered 87 uh, officers and soldiers killed on the 7th of October in their clash. Hamas attacked 11 military barracks on that day. They've attacked 10 police uh, headquarters in all the Gaza envelope. So they were engaged with the army, and the Israeli army reacted after seven hours and bombed its own people because, of course, they had a doctrine that is Hannibal and it allowed them to kill the Israelis while they are uh, potentially taken as hostages or prisoners. So uh, because of that, because of the um, destruction of the image of the invincible army, Hamas has inflicted something on the Israeli army that is unforgivable. However, there is something even more. The lack of certainty that Hamas has imposed on the settlers, pushing all the settlers to leave more between 70 to 120,000 settlers who have lost confidence in the army and in the government who came to Israel from all over the world because they were offered free land and the protection. So what do they do with the free land if they don't have a protection? Uh, they know and they are very much aware that they are standing on a ground that doesn't belong to them. And because of that, because of the lack of certainty and because of the uncertainty that Hamas has inflicted on the Israeli settlers, this is equivalent to I don't know how many nuclear bombs. And that can never be repaired unless Gaza is totally destroyed and the Israeli kill 2.3 million people, which is something they will not achieve. Therefore, the security that the settlers are asking, and according to the Israeli statistics, more than 600,000 Israelis fled the country and went back to the country they came from and where they originally were born. And this is where their roots are because there is a lack of certainty. That is one of the biggest achievements of Hamas. Now, if we want to move to other tactical issues that, of course, the Israeli army bombed Gaza, it's extremely easy for any army, very well equipped, one of the most modern armies in the world, with the support of 230 aircraft and 30 ships full of ammunition from the United States, Canada, the uh, UK, France, to bomb Gaza and to have unlimited resources of ammunition, it is very easy to destroy your objective in front of you if it is made of city and buildings where you don't care where the bomb is falling, which is what the Israelis have done. However, once the bombardment has stopped, no Hamas fighter ever raised the white flag to an Israeli jet or an Israeli artillery or a navy. The Israeli infantry has to go in and the Israeli infantry went in. And that was the Hamas feast because they were given the possibility to prove that they can engage with the Israelis face to face and defeat them. And why I'm saying defeating them is not because I have a stand to take here, it's because the Israelis today, they have announced, we have pulled out of the north of Gaza, and at the exception of one main street. So by saying we pulled out, I don't think this is a win. You know, and it's interesting too. So I want to go back to something that I had mentioned before, which I want to get your thoughts on. And that is the fact that Israel, as it was saying, we're going to withdraw these brigades from Gaza, took the decision to do a targeted airstrike on Hamas leader Saleh al aruri in Beirut a few days ago, which was a massive escalation on the Lebanon front. Um, so can you talk a bit about the significance of that targeted assassination Particularly, I mean, on the one hand, they were, of course, playing with Hezbollah's red lines, but also they they portrayed it afterwards as some sort of victory because they got a Hamas leader. Um, is the how significant is that? Did they do significant damage to Hamas by killing this person? 
Okay, so let us look at the role of Saleh al aruri but not only him. There were two other commanders of the Qassam, which were even more important than him, and they were in Lebanon, and they were killed in what is known to be Hamas office in Beirut, the, the Lebanese capital. All these three people, plus the other four that were killed in that uh, target assassination, were in Lebanon, not in Gaza. So from the day they have killed Al Aruri and his companions to today, the to two days, what happened in Gaza? The Israelis today withdrew from Gaza. So did the killing change anything in the course of action inside Gaza of the Palestinian resistance? Were these three people on the ground in Gaza? No. These three people serve Hamas and they are significant within Hamas once the war ends or before the war to prepare for a war or to equip Hamas or to support Hamas or to extend the connection as Aruri used to do with Iran, with Qatar, with Turkey, because by the way, he was coming back from a tour to Qatar and Turkey when he was assassinated. He was someone who was going around of that, taking normal planes with his name, his passport, without any problem and calling for meetings in the what is known to be Hamas office in Beirut. So he was not hiding because he believed that if he wants to, if he's going to be killed, he's going to be killed anyway, anywhere. So that's a part of the target assassination. It's a, a very small uh, euphoric um, joy for Netanyahu that he, he cannot really sell to the Israeli population. And if tomorrow he killed uh, not only Saleh al aruri but if he killed Muhammad al-Daif, or he killed Yahya Sinwar, these organizations like Hezbollah, like uh, the Iraqi resistance, like the Syrian resistance, like the Yemeni resistance, they, ha they have a uh, horizontal leadership. One is removed, there are 100 others that can replace him. It is not a pyramid where you remove one piece of the pyramid and the whole pyramid falls. No, he can enjoy it for one day. And then what is next? What is happening on the ground? Is your assassination changing anything on the ground? If you go and plant bombs in Iran, Kerman, for example, what is going to change? There is one thing that in Netanyahu hope before I go to the consequences of hitting Beirut is in all the implication to go and kill an Iranian IRGC general, uh, Razi Musawi in Syria, and then a few days later, uh, killing uh, Saleh al aruri and then uh, killing, uh, uh, we have an explosion of um, IEDs, two IEDs in Kerman in the south of Iran, and then the target assassination of one of the Hashti Shabi leaders in Baghdad, they are all related. They lead to one point, is inviting Iran, uh, Yemen, uh, uh, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon to escalate and enlarge the front. Because enlarging the front really helps Netanyahu. Now he's under attack from his government because the uh, far right wing uh, members of the government who form his coalition wants him to escalate even further and destroy Gaza. It's something that he cannot do and he saw the capability of the army. There is no harmony between the aspiration of the political leadership in Israel and the capability of the army to defeat the resistance in Gaza. Therefore, his only hope to survive and remain in power, because if he doesn't, the ministers uh, threaten to resign. And if they resign, it means his government falls and he will be immediately in front of the justice system for all the corruption accusation that he, is, uh, he was confronted with and he managed to escape because he is a prime minister today. And then the only thing is to enlarge the conflict and to widen it and to say to the Israeli people, 
you have to stick with me because we can't change a government during the war and we have to wait until the war ends. But now we have another enemy like Hezbollah, for example. So the war is against Iran and its allies. And they love to say Iran and its proxies. So this is what the information that Netanyahu would like to give to his population and for all the main um, stream media to grab it and start dwelling on it and divert the attention away from Gaza and the Palestinian cause. Because the Palestinian cause has earned the support of most of the population worldwide, and because uh, Netanyahu is embarrassed by the uh, American uh, insistence on the fact that he needs to achieve his objectives or find a way out, and the find way out means going to prison, then he's trying to drag other countries with him. Now, this is why Hezbollah, and I come to that, is not going to, um, is going to respond. It has to respond because by not responding, as I know the Israeli and Hezbollah know the Israelis, they will go next day and look for another target. It can be a Yemeni in Beirut or an Iraqi or an Iranian or Hezbollah leader. So they can go and target any of these leaders in the suburb of Beirut because Hezbollah did not answer and because Netanyahu didn't see the, the consequences of his act. So Netanyahu needs to see targeting the suburb of Beirut or targeting uh, any building and killing people, regardless the identity of the person who was assassinated or the person were assassinated, then Hezbollah has to respond. Now, the response is going to be an intelligent one. Why intelligent? Because Hezbollah doesn't want to fall into the Israeli trap. So the Hezbollah resistance group needs to think about a hit that is hard enough to hurt Benjamin Netanyahu, but not hard enough to push him to declare war on Lebanon. Because if he does that, then perhaps the Palestinian cause will be more or less forgotten. And then we, the whole population and the social media will be diverted toward another war. This is where Hezbollah is very careful. And Iran is very careful not to respond to Kirman in the way that it would like to respond. Or the Iraqi uh, Hashtashah, because the Americans hit a uh, nutrition force. This is why the prime minister described it as a terrorist act for the first time. And today he formed a committee to discuss the way to ask the, Israel, the Americans to leave the country as soon as possible. It's going to be hard because the Americans hold many cards. Above all, the Article 6 of the United Nations that they can push to turn it into 7. And if not, all the all revenue that come to Iraq goes to New York first. And this is what ben Donald Trump in the past threatened to hold on the money to prevent the Iraqis from having their revenues, which is 90% of the total revenue of, the, uh, of Iraq, if they force the Americans to leave. So it's a kind of a blackmail and bullying. So to go back to Hezbollah, Hezbollah will respond. It doesn't uh, have the option not to respond, but the response has to be very carefully uh, studied to the point that is painful enough, but not too painful. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a difficult balancing act. It, it, it's and I must say, mm -hmm. I mean, the level of patience and restraint that the forces of resistance across the region have to have. Uh, it's pretty stunning. You look at the way that they behave and there's so much strategy and thought that goes into every decision they make because like you said, they don't want all out war. Whereas the US and Israel are just completely reckless and just keep playing with fire. And real quick, before I go to my next question, I do wanna thank uh, Tarani Ahmadi Parker and Nestor Gonzalez for the donations and the, and the super chat. Uh, and also remind everybody who's watching to make sure you like this episode. It helps boost us in the algorithm so more people can see uh, Elijah give his very informed analysis, which you won't see on CNN. Um, but Elijah, I wanna, since you, we're not talking about 
other parts of the region. I want to move uh, to the issue of Lebanon for, the, for a moment. You know, his, uh, Nasrallah gave two speeches this week. I know you watched both of them. Uh, and there's a few things he said that I thought were interesting that he hadn't said before. One thing in particular was that the decision for Hezbollah to enter or to open the Lebanon front on October 8th uh, was made, of course, in large part to, you know, in solidarity with Gaza to help uh, relieve pressure on Hamas, uh, which they've certainly done by diverting a lot of Israeli army resources to the northern front um, or their southern front. But moreover, for the first time, he said that this was also done as a preemptive uh, way to prevent Israel from launching a parallel attack on Lebanon. Uh, and I, when I say attack, I mean an all out attack on Lebanon. And we have seen in both the US and Israeli media, it's been revealed that the Israelis did in fact have a plan to launch a war in conjunction with its war on Gaza, also on Lebanon preemptively to get rid of Hezbollah as they were also trying to get rid of Hamas. That of course didn't happen. The US media claimed it was because Biden put a stop to it. Uh, the Israeli media, the Israeli media said it was because Netanyahu put a stop to it. Regardless, they're both of those uh, states are claiming that that was in fact the case. So that was one thing he said. Um, and another uh, significant aspect of what, uh, well, at least what I think, another significant aspect of what he said this week was what you've also mentioned, which is that they have no choice but to respond. Because Israel only understands force, and it's clear at this point the international community will protect no one, so only those with weapons and strength uh, can protect themselves. So I just mentioned that all as some background to ask you, when we talk about Hezbollah's role in this broader regional war on these different fronts, you know, what are Hezbollah's red lines? We know they don't want all-out war. Right. We know a lot of these different uh, uh, forces of resistance don't want all out, all out war, but obviously there are red lines. So what would have to happen for Hezbollah to say, OK, all bets are off. All limitations are off. We have to go to war. We have no choice. And furthermore, what are Hezbollah's capabilities? And obviously their capabilities are huge because they do have strategic deterrence against Israel. OK, so let us take uh, say uh, Nostrallah. Hezbollah Secretary General's words without taking what he said for granted. And let us see if we can understand if what he said is right or practical or was really uh, true what he was saying. So first of all, if Israel understand the force or not. We have seen in the West Bank and Gaza how the Israelis treat the um, people in Gaza and the resistance in Gaza and how Israel treats the West Bank. So the West Bank is supposed to be under the control of the Palestinians. There are more than 4,500 Palestinians arrested uh, from the West Bank since the 7th of October, and 380 Palestinians killed in the West Bank, what's supposed to be the Palestinian states. Moreover, on the 7th of October, Hamas asked the release of 7,000 prisoners from the Israeli jail, of which 6,700 of the West Bank, these people who don't have weapons as the resistance in Gaza and don't want to fight. So if you happens and you, ha you are strong, the Israelis are more afraid of you. This is what's happening in Gaza today. Of course they're bombing, but are they managing to stay in one place? Of course not, because there is an armed resistance that can confront them. In the West Bank, they go in, they kill, they assassinated people. We've seen on videos how they kill one, two, three youngsters unarmed, and then they leave unaccountable. This is why if you're not strong, then you are eaten alive. Secondly, uh, Hezbollah's capability. When I said that Hezbollah is going to respond intelligently, but hard enough to make sure that Netanyahu understood the message. It's because before the 7th of October, there is a, um, the, any operation, the room will have a bank of objectives. And the bank of objectives is related directly to the capability of the organization. So we have Hezbollah, it's a non state actor, it's a, a non. Um, Non, it's, a, it's an organized uh, group, it's an organized army, but it is a non-official army, but an organized one. 
So it is, it has the level of any army. So for that, they look what they have. For example, the surface to surface missiles. So we're talking about how Hezbollah can hit all the oil platforms that are opposite the Israeli shores, close down the harbor of Haifa and Ishtud and close down the airports. What is the choice here? So all these are uh, very painful for the Israeli economy that is suffering today between 18 billion and is going up potentially to 58 billion according to the Israeli information media. Therefore, that can really hurt the Israelis without dragging to war. So without causing a war, Israel can hit these targets. Now, uh, sorry, Hezbollah can hit these targets. Now, is Hezbollah capable of hitting these targets? Well, we know for sure that Hezbollah has the Yafunt missiles that are supersonic missiles, and they have been given by Syria. So yes, Hezbollah has the potentiality to hit these targets with missiles that are very difficult to intercept. Secondly, Hezbollah has uh, kamikaze drones, more, much more advanced than the one used in Ukraine, with a more powerful explosive in their warhead. Can one um, uh, drone reach Karich, for example? Of course, yes, it can. Because in the last uh, two weeks, a drone launched from Iraq reached Karich. And why that was launched from Iraq? It's intelligent. It's an intelligent move because it, uh, the purpose is not for the Israeli to turn against the Lebanese and to escalate and go and hit other objectives than the one between two to five kilometers that Hezbollah asked the Israeli indirectly to remain uh, the exchange of fire within this limit. This is why we understand that Hezbollah can hit oil platforms. Moreover, there are other missiles that Iran has that are much more powerful than the Yahoo and that Hezbollah has. And I'm sure Hezbollah will be delighted to show them in due course. So now we're talking about hitting the Israeli economy. What about hitting other targets? We've seen Hezbollah using the Burkan uh, rockets, which are between 250 to 500 kilograms of explosive. Well, there are Burkan that um, has not been used so far the, with the capability of 2,000 uh, kilo of explosive. So can you imagine for the first time the Israeli tasting what, they, what the Palestinians have been living under for the first time? It will, I, I don't want to say it will terrify them, even if it, it causes no casualties, but the mere fact they can see a hole of six, seven meters in the ground and think how this can fall on their head, they will never return to the uh, northern borders. And there are already more than 100,000 uh, Israeli settlers who left mm -hmm. the borders to uh, Ilat and they are living in tents because there are no more places in hotels. So they are again refugee for the first time and they are uh, living and experiencing what the Palestinians have been living since 1948. Because for people who don't know, most of Gaza is made of camp, Jabalia camp, Beit Yahoun camp, Khan Yunis, everything in uh, Gaza is made of camps. So now the Israelis are also living in camps and they understand what that means. Already the Israelis are telling the Israeli prime minister and the defense minister, they don't want to return and let the problem with Hezbollah is solved and the Israeli cabinet doesn't have a solution for Hezbollah on the northern border. So that's one of the capabilities. Other capabilities, today the uh, war is an intelligent war. So the person or the organization who hold the largest number of missiles and the heaviest um, missile carrying the largest number of explosives is the one that stands out. Now, we know that Israel has that, but is Israel ready 
to receive all the missiles that come from Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah has other missiles that are precision missiles. We're talking about a Fatah 110, a Fatah 313, and all the series of Al Fatah that vary in range, with one difference that Hezbollah has modified these missiles. Why? Because Hezbollah doesn't need the range of 400 to 800 meters, uh, kilometers to hit Israel. Hezbollah needs to hit Haifa and Tel Aviv, and they are within 20 to 60 kilometers. So instead of having a missile, a precision missile that can carry only 450 kilogram of explosive, it can carry much more for a lesser distance. And uh, people would think, well, there is the Iron Dome. Well, let's take the Israeli statistic that the Iron Dome is capable of intercepting 55 to 60% of the missiles. Well, I want to add another bonus to the Israelis and say 70%. So we have only 30% of Hezbollah's missiles that can go through. Now, it's very easy to flood the Iron Dome with uh, hundreds of missiles on day one. Well, I expect thousands, not hundreds, on the day one. And after that, Hezbollah can maintain between 400 to 500 missiles and rockets on daily basis for over a year. This is what I think Hezbollah has prepared the arsenal for. So if the Hezbollah fled the Iron Dome, most of the precision and heavy missiles will go through. But I accept with 30%. So out of 1,000, we have 300 only managing to go through. I think there are enough to cause major destruction in Haifa and Tel Aviv. Uh, that will teach the Israeli a lesson they will never forget. Of course, Israel had the capability to turn Lebanon into the dark age and to uh, uh, a cave age, but the next cave will be an Israeli one because Hezbollah had the capability to do exactly the same by only hitting the sensitive area that Hezbollah showed throughout the years with its bank of objectives. In Hebrew, the, um, all the uh, details of the locations and the coordinate of every single position. It's really important, everything you're pointing out. And of course, it's absolutely, absolutely true. Nobody's questioning whether Israel has superior air power. We know they do. We see what they can do in Gaza, and they could easily carpet bomb all of Lebanon. No one, Everybody knows that. But the question becomes, are they willing to pay the price for that. And you just laid out the price for that. And with Israel, it's a country that needs security to keep its settlers there. If you get rid of that security, like you said, people leave, people have already left. And so uh, I have uh, one point. please. Is, um, about if Hezbollah was next. And uh, when Said Nasrallah said that Hezbollah would have been attacked and Lebanon would have been attacked. Mm. Now, I want to argue that what he's saying is pure speculation. But let us see if that is possible. So if Hezbollah remained watching what's happening in Gaza without interfering and doing nothing at all, Israel would have allowed the presence of, let's say, 10,000 soldiers on the borders because Hezbollah is not reacting. And, Hezbollah, and Israel managed to mobilize more than 450,000 men on uh, the 7th of October and within the first two weeks, which means that the Israelis were prepared for a large war and a big war on multiple fronts. This is why they have called the Americans from day one and the Americans send their carriers. They've sent 2,000 uh, Delta Force to Tel Aviv. They've sent generals. They've sent uh, another special forces. Uh, to Israel to support them. They say they are in reconnaissance above uh, Gaza, so the British, but, and, but we know what reconnaissance means. So they are there and they are there to support Israel because Israel said on the first day, I am not capable of facing the axis of the resistance. I need help. And Biden said, which showed the weakness of Israel, by the way, and Biden said, I am going to send you the help that you need. Mm -hmm. Now, with this presence 
and the readiness of the international community to accept all crimes and crimes against humanity and genocide committed against the Palestinians, nobody is going to blink an eye against Hezbollah. On the contrary, Hamas and Hezbollah in the eyes of the Americans are considered terrorist organization. And this definition belongs only to the Americans. It is not a universal definition because there is no definition of terrorism. And what is terrorism for the Americans is freedom fighter for the Palestinians, in case of Palestinians, and the same applies on Lebanon um, for Hezbollah. So who is going to care about what's happening to Hezbollah? And exactly the same narrative that Hamas is hiding behind the children and women of Gaza. The same will be used in Lebanon that Hezbollah is hiding behind the children and women of Lebanon. So what's going to happen is the war on Gaza will be very swift, quick, and destructive, much more than it is today. The resistance in Gaza would not have had the time to breathe, and the uh, bombardment would have been devastating. And can you imagine 400,000 men, uh, if we leave 50,000 to Lebanon, 400,000 men or 300,000, because the commander needs to leave part as a reservist to um, inject in the battlefield uh, on time, depending on the uh, on which area and on which front. So let's say 300,000 men attacking Gaza in one go. They will manage to destroy it and occupy it and destroy everything before they walk in. So yeah. after finishing Gaza, in this euphoric moment of victory, so that will be a victory for Israel and for Netanyahu and his right wing, uh, far right wing. Because, I mean, this terminology is not right because Netanyahu is far right too. So yeah. in the, uh, the Likud party is more far right than the far right. So uh, let's consider we, yeah, let's talk about the uh, main uh, far uh, right, Smotrich and Ben Gvir and uh, uh, all the rest of the band. So with these ministers, he would happily move immediately on the Lebanese front mm -hmm. and attack them. And the whole international community will applaud Israel because Ursula von der Leyen went to Israel and said, Europe stands with you, although she doesn't speak in the name of Europe. She's not the representative of Europe abroad. It's Joseph Borrell. Secondly, she doesn't speak in the name of the European foreign policy that is never united, is always uh, non-united and is always in clash with one another. Thirdly, the Canadian, the Germans, the Australian, the Americans, uh, the French, the British, everybody supported Benjamin Netanyahu and will do exactly the same in Lebanon. But by starting the war, Hezbollah did something very clever. First of all, by accepting to be engaged in the war, it has changed the deployment of its 7,000 special forces on the borders. Secondly, it has evacuated all the positions that are known in preparation of war without being surprised. Uh, mm -hmm. Thirdly, it has prepared in uh, learning the experience of dealing with the Israelis by watching and taking lessons from what's happening in Gaza and how the Israelis are dealing with Hezbollah on the borders. So all these are lessons to be learned. What is going to be and in which shape is going to be the next war? This is very important for those in every single um, resistance group and school around the world, but also all the militaries around the world are watching what's happening in Gaza and drawing lessons because there are many lessons to be drawn in this experience that the Israeli army has never experienced before because the Israeli army uh, moves into a city after the bombardment, not before. So they flatten the area and then they move to reduce the casualties. But they don't understand that they are today faced with a resistance equal to what happened in 2006 in south of Lebanon 
were they destroyed and then they were met uh, face to face with Hezbollah in small villages in the same house sometimes on the ground floor and on the upper floor <laughs> or the two meters one against another. So all these are lessons drawn from this uh, war and they are very valuable. This is why Hezbollah cannot be surprised today. And this is why Israel can no longer declare war on Hezbollah or on Lebanon. And another point is Hezbollah showed the capability of the most advanced version of the uh, laser-guided anti-tank net missiles, not only the double one, but the one that reached seven to eight kilometers, a weapon that has never been used before. And that tells a lot because no Merkava tank, Merkava mm -hmm. 4, Israeli tank, can cross the border and be within range of any Hezbollah before being totally destroyed because the difference of range is of wow. four kilometers. So there's no way Israel can invade Lebanon. <laughs> However, there is a potentiality that Israel can destroy the villages on the south of Lebanon, but also all the settlers will never return home. I mean, that's else. huge. That's... Yeah, that that's huge. I mean, this is this is unprecedented. And in today's speech, Nisrella did make the point that it's ironic for all this, you know, all the years since Israel's founding, the people of the South have constantly been displaced and massacred. And now for the first time, the tables have turned and now all these settlers in the North have been displaced. Um, Elijah, I want to zoom out uh, before we start to wrap up here. I want to zoom out a bit on the region. But before I do that, I want to um, uh, remind the audience that uh, please do like this uh, show on YouTube, like the uh, episode on YouTube. It helps us in the algorithm. I think it's fantastic. There's 1,500 people, more than 1,500 people watching, which is great. But I see only 561 likes. So let's uh, boost that up to at least half of you. Come on, guys. Like the show. It helps us in the algorithm. All you have to do is click the thumbs up. It's super easy. Sorry, so Elijah, I have to that up. constantly scold our audience. Um, but anyways, moving on, I want to, I want to zoom out to the region because we're talking about the fronts that Israel's fighting, which is Gaza and the Lebanon front. And of course it has a, a nonstop help from the U S with weapons shipments and the U S aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean. But the other fronts, the U S is the primary, uh, aggressor, if you will. Uh, and here I'm talking about Iraq. And I'm talking about Yemen, um, Syria. It's kind of a mixed bag. Israel hits, the U.S. hits. But in Iraq, you mentioned that just the other day, the is uh, I think it was yesterday, not just the other day, uh, the U.S. assassinated a, a PMF commander in Baghdad, which was pretty unprecedented, at least in the last year or so. We haven't seen that sort of thing take place. And also, this is somebody who's technically a part of the Iraqi security forces because the Hashid, the PMF, has been folded into the Iraqi security forces. So that was a pretty big attack on Iraq's sovereignty by the U.S. And then a few days earlier, the U.S. attacked or sank three Yemeni ships and killed 10 Yemeni naval officers. All of this is, of course, an attempt to uh, shield Israel from the consequences of its genocide in Gaza. But, you know, this, what I think is interesting in all this is that you know, this, it, the U.S.'s uh, deterrence, the U.S. and Israeli's deterrence across the region has kind of collapsed because despite the fact that they keep killing people, keep assassinating people, the resistance axis across the region is is going. The Yemenis are still doing what they're doing in the Red Sea. The Iraqis are still hitting U.S. bases. I mean, this is not the Middle East of twenty of 2003 when the U.S. could just invade, invade Iraq without any consequences. There exists this resistance axis across the region that is firing back. So I want, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your thoughts when we talk about a potential regional war here um, that could happen. The longer Gaza goes on, the longer the likelihood of regional war could happen. Given that there are actually two sides this time, what would that look like? What would, would it, what would it look like for the U.S.? What would it look like for Israel? And we know that they're capable of doing an extreme amount of damage, but could they even win? Oh, no. Did I lose you again, Elijah? So, first oh, of no. all, I think... Uh, I thought it froze. I, I hear you now. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> 
I think um, you complain about the liking. You're very likable, but I think I am the problem here. <laughs> no, um, no, no. So now I don't think there is going to be an all-out war for a simple reason. It's very easy for the Houthis to block the Red Sea to all navigation and to say no more ship can cross here and that's it. So that will bring the problem to another level because the Americans have um, taken on their uh, shoulders the protection of all the seas as a superpower. And they cannot look like incapable of assuring the navigation in international waters. This is why the, the Ansarullah were very limited to one thing saying, lift the siege on Gaza, we allow you to receive your merchandise. So it's only limited to Gaza for people not to divert the attention away from what's happening in Gaza. And is not going to be any, in the future, any Ansarullah step that will divert the attention away from Gaza. That for Yemen. Now for Iran, Iran received a hit yesterday in Kerman, and there was a communique uh, issued by the Islamic State that an insult to any intelligent person, because it was written with so many mistakes. Anyone who's following the Takfiri or these uh, jihadi groups understand that the language was so poorly made to say, it is not me, but it is me. So just there are mistakes that were made on purpose to say, yes, it is not the Islamic State, but we want to say it is an Islamic State to say that we are, it is us. Because Islamic State doesn't call uh, Iran by Iran, but Khorasan, and they don't call fighters, they say Mujahideen or Istishadiyin. So there are another language and another terminology to the point that an amateur understand it. This is why the fake communique was on purpose distributed to, to be highlighted as fake and to understand that behind it are intelligence services. But Iran is not going to respond in a way to divert the attention and to make it as an Israeli-Iranian war. There are other ways to respond, but not now. Now, many people are frustrated when they don't see an answer because they think this kind of war is run on Twitter or on X or on social media. It is not. It's much more sophisticated than that. It is okay if the public is not pleased for this country or this group not answering in the way they like. Or perhaps this group has promised, but the circumstances can change. If today Hezbollah, for example, to fulfill the promise and to say, uh, Beirut in exchange of Tel Aviv, and he, Hezbollah bombs Tel Aviv. This is exactly what Netanyahu wants. And he wants the war to be diverted away from Gaza. So it is counterproductive for Hezbollah to do so today because in a time of peace, Hezbollah can do it because it's so obvious. You bomb the capital, we bomb the capital, what you consider your capital. But in case of war, all the rules of engagement change. Because of that, the war is not run on social media. And because it is not run on social media, there's no, uh, there's no space for tit for tat. And there is no space for you hit me, I will hit you immediately. No, we're going to be like Christian and turn the other cheek and then wait for the time when the time comes to know how to hit back and to hit back when it is not going to create uh, a circumstances where it is counterproductive or damage Palestine or damage the Palestinian people or damage the Palestinian cause or damages further the children and women of Gaza. It is important to continue and keep the focus on what's happening in Gaza and Gaza only. If Israel hits okay. Lebanon or, or Iraq, it's okay, the Iraqis are containing themselves. Or they can, they have missiles even more than Hezbollah, by the way, because they are an official army and they have warehouses. 
they can destroy the uh, more than one American military base willingly. And the Iraqis can receive hits and accept casualties much more than the uh, Americans. Well, they've lost one million um, person during the 2000, 2003 invasion of Iraq, and they are ready to lose 10,000 in uh, with a resort to destroy and Al-Assad totally and completely. But what will be the position of the Americans in this case? Will the American people accept to lose so many men and women in service only to protect Hezbollah, uh, not Hezbollah, to protect Benjamin Netanyahu's position because it's a personal war. Now Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to enlarge the war only to stay in power. He understands he can't achieve any objective. This is why he is fighting and doing everything possible to stay in power. So why Iran or Iraq or the uh, Ansarullah or Hezbollah will give him such a big favor and then go and fight an all-out war and start launching missiles that they have just to show they have the potentiality to do it. Well, Israel knows that uh, all these groups are capable of damaging Israel. It's enough. They don't need to show their, their strengths in the wrong moment. You know, I just really quickly, before we uh, finish up here, I want to ask you to respond to a couple of claims that I constantly see, uh, uh, like uttered by the people who support Israel. And one of those claims is that the Israeli, like Hamas is losing. It's on the verge of defeat. The Israelis are winning. Um, I hear that. I, I'm actually always stunned when I kind of poke my head into the conversations that they're having because they seem to believe their own propaganda. I'm not talking about the Israeli leadership here because I think the Israeli leadership is a bit more realistic about what's happening, especially the military leadership. But those mostly in the West who support Israel uh, really do think that the Israelis are winning and that the U.S. and the Israelis have control of the entire region. And when I look at what, what's happening, every after I've listened to everything you've said, Yes, of course, they're causing so much devastation, but I just don't see that at all. And I think it's really important that you frame this as Netanyahu's war, because I think what we've seen from October 7th onwards is that this particular Israeli leadership is perfectly willing to sacrifice their own people to stay in power. But anyways, just how would you respond to that claim that you'll hear is that Israel's winning. Palestinian, I mean, Hamas is on the verge of defeat. Israel's winning. Hezbollah's weak. Yemenis are weak, Iraq is weak, they don't have our power, and they don't know what's coming to them. People around the world are divided into different categories. Those who support Israel blindly, and no point in discussing with them, and those who uh, don't want to be informed, mm -hmm. and those who are informed by mainstream media, and they, have, um, they are not guilty because they don't know. And the fourth one is those who are not willing to be informed and to take the trouble to look for the reality. Perhaps they don't have the time to do so. So I can start with one single word. When people, particularly in America, they say, you cannot be anti-Semite. I fully agree with that. Because if I am anti-Semite, it means I am anti-Palestinian. Because anti-Semite is anti-Palestinian, or anti-Lebanese, or anti-Southern Syria. These are the Semite people. But no, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Likud party, and before him is Haq Shamir, and before him, uh, before Netanyahu, um, uh, Ariel Sharon, and all the people who led the country, they offered a false narrative by confiscating certain terminology and offering a completely different story. First of all, this is not a religious war. There is no point in people saying, I am a Jew and I am proud of supporting Israel. There is no connection because there are so many Jews against Israel. Because when you say you are a Jew, you're indicating a religion. That's your business. The war is about land that has been taken and given from the British, and the decision was in 1917 by um, Lord Belfort, who decided 
not to give it to the Jew, but to give it to the Zionist movement. It is in his declaration. Anyone can go on internet and look at Belfort Declaration 1917 that was given from Lord Belfort to Lord Rothschild. So it is not about the Jew. The Palestinian Jew, the, uh, because I say Palestinian Jew, because Golda Meir on YouTube, you have her saying, since 1921, I am a Palestinian until 1948, and I carry a Palestinian passport. These are the words of Israel Prime Minister. She said, I am so the Palestinian Jew, the Palestinian Christians, and the Palestinian Muslims lived together for decades. And all those who lived in Palestine, who originate from the land, are Semite. So when you say you cannot be anti-Semite, it doesn't mean I am not anti-Israel. It means I am not anti the Semite that the live in that part of the world. And if you look on Google, Semitism is a language. It is not Israel. It has nothing to do with Israel. So if we are informed about the terminology that we are using, then we start understanding what is uh, the conflict about. It's about a population that used to live in the land and someone else came from abroad, created uh, groups, the Haganah, the Stern uh, Gang, the Lehi, and they are recognized as terrorist groups and start killing Arabs. And British, and some of them, like Ishaq Shamir, killed also Jew. So, this is what it is about. It is about the Israelis who form the country don't want the place for the Palestinian to live with them. Now, some people say Hamas doesn't recognize Israel. In 2018, Hamas accepted the two state solutions. Hamas recognized the presence of Israel as a reality that they can live with, but the Israelis don't want them. As the uh, Israeli ministers say, let us nuke Gaza, let us destroy Gaza. That is about. So when you say who's winning, it depends. If you look at who killed the largest number of children and women, Israel is winning. If you look at who killed the most, uh, the largest number of United Nations personnel, no, Israel is winning. The Hamas did not manage to kill not even one UN personnel. Is um, who is destroying all the schools and uh, uh, breaking into hospitals, destroying them, preventing cutting water and electricity? Israel is uh, winning because nobody can impose collective. A punishment, but Israel. So in these terms, Israel is winning. So what I think <coughs> is important is for people not to take side, but to go and educate themselves about the uh, what's happening. See how many Jews stands against Israel. See how many Israeli stands against Israel. Look at Haaretz newspaper doesn't stand against Israel and what the Israelis are doing. I have so many Israeli friends who stand against Israel and the killing of the children and women. Who stands against the killing, the, the massacre of children and women? How can you say why Israel is killing 22,500 civilians and respond, oh, because of the 7th of October? Are you justifying the killing of 22,000 500? Are you justifying the um, collective punishment? Are you justifying the, um, the break of international law, the non-respect of uh, the Geneva Convention, everything? We live in a jungle only because we support Israel. So go and learn, people, and then I'm extremely happy to be contradicted. <laughs> well, Elijah, I want to thank you for joining me uh, to break all of this down. Can, before we uh, end here, can you just tell people where they can follow your work? Um, on my um, Twitter account, and uh, they can subscribe, and I will be very grateful. Elijah, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it.